Hello, and welcome to this teaching from Calvary Albuquerque. We are excited to hear from our special guest speaker, Dr. Erwin Lutzer, a clear expositor of the Bible who serves as a senior pastor of the Moody Church in Chicago. We pray that God uses this message to strengthen your faith in the Lord. If it does, we'd love to hear about it. Email us at mystory@calvaryabq.org. And if you'd like to support this ministry financially, you can give online securely at calvaryabq.org slash giving. Now I invite you to mark your Bibles in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and 2 Corinthians chapter 5 as Dr. Lutzer begins the message, Your Eternal Reward, Triumph and Tears at the Judgment Seat of Christ. Good morning. Well, this is a historic week in Albuquerque. It's the Balloon Fiesta Week. That's always welcome, isn't it? Isn't it great to look up and see those ornaments hanging all over our sky? So it's Balloon Fiesta Week, but it's also Erwin Lutzer Week. Uh, Erwin Lutzer uh, has one of the distinctive voices in the Christian world, not only um, what he has to say, but how he says it. Uh, some people come just to hear him pronounce the word God. Um, it's just that beautiful, deep, resonating voice that he has. Erwin Lutzer is the uh, pastor of the Moody Church in Chicago, the uh, Dwight L. Moody Memorial Church in Chicago. He's been the pastor there for well, since 1980. And um, he also has heard on radio broadcasts three different radio programs uh, in over a thousand outlets around the world and the country. His program is Running to Win. Do you hear that on uh, the radio station? Yeah, it's, we play it every single day in uh, K KNKT. Also, Songs in the Night and the Moody Church Hour. He has authored over 40 books. I've got some catching up to do because 40 books and every one that I've read is good. I want more. He always instructs. He goes deep. It's inspiring. He wrote a new one coming out in a couple months. I did a little endorsement for it. That is another great book. Um, uh, what he's going to share today is also summed up in a book. And I'm telling you, here's why I'm telling you this. Because after hearing this message, you're going to want more. And he wrote a book called Your Eternal Reward, and what he's going to be sharing today is expanded on in that book. And we have a section in our bookstore that's just devoted uh, to his books this weekend. Also, last but not least, Erwin Lutzer does hands down the best Billy Graham impersonation of anyone I've ever met. Now, I thought I did a good one, and a few people have flattered me and said it's the best, after this, you'll never want me to try it again. It's so good. And so just maybe, if we encourage uh, Dr. Lutzer, he would do that for us again this morning like he did last year. Please welcome Erwin Lutzer. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're all so kind and uh, skip. After that introduction, I can hardly wait to hear what I'm going to say. <laughs> this ought to be good. I bring you greetings from Chicago, the city of righteousness, truth, love, justice. <laughs> I was telling the folks this morning, one day last winter, it was so cold that according to the media, some of our um, politicians were actually seen with their hands in their own pockets. <laughs> tell you, it gets cold in Chicago. <laughs> and what about them, their Cubs? They're in the playoffs. <laughs> you know, last year we were able to buy a t-shirt in Chicago, a Cub t-shirt that says anyone can have a bad century. <laughs> uh, certainly the Cubs approved that. In fact, one day last year, their pitching machine actually pitched a no-hitter, I mean. <laughs> and this year, they're in the playoffs. Wow. The good old Chicago Cubs. You know, you folks here in Albuquerque, you know, you're individualistic. You have your own views. And there is a story about somebody who came down from Washington, D.C., an officer from the DEA, the department of, uh, you know, uh, the drug department enforcement agency. And he came to one of your farmers and said, uh, I'm here to inspect your farm to see whether or not you're growing marijuana. 
And the farmer here in uh, New Mexico said, uh, sure, you can go anywhere, but do you see that field over there, that one over there? Don't go over there, but anywhere else you can go. The, uh, the official pulled out his badge and said, look at this, DEA, I, uh, the Department of uh, Homeland Investigation and Drug Enforcement Agency, I can go anywhere I like, government authority. Farmer, oh, okay. A few months later, that's of course exactly the field to which the official went. And suddenly, the farmer hears this shriek when this um, officer is shrieking and across the field, a great big bull is coming and charging the man. And the farmer said, show him your badge, show him your badge. <laughs> sometimes we have authority over things and sometimes we don't. I hope you get used to the Moody Church website. Go there and uh, moodymedia.org is another one of our websites where you can get books and CDs and all those other things. And also, God willing, I'm going to be leading a tour to the sites of the Reformation in June in Germany and Switzerland. Uh, some of you may be able to come with us. I've done it about a half dozen times and enjoy leading people in those parts of the world. Well, I just want to say what a delight it has been for Rebecca and me to be here with Skip and his wife. And do you folks realize how fortunate you are to have this kind of leadership in this church? If Skip and I were closer together geographically, I think we'd be together an awful lot because we really connect. And, uh, you know, he mentioned uh, Billy Graham. Well, Billy stand six foot two in his socks. I said that to a friend of mine. He said, that's interesting. How tall is he without them? <laughs> Depends a little bit on the socks that you are wearing. I was on a plane. A woman said, you have a blue sock and a red sock. Your socks don't match. I said, oh, yes, they do, because I go by thickness. <laughs> are you aware of the fact that your pastor has written a new book that is coming out in a couple of weeks entitled Defying Normal? Until you read it, of course, you're just going to have to be normal, but afterwards, you're going to be abnormal. You're going to define normal. Good book on the book of Daniel. Readable, welcoming, excellent material. I hope you all get a copy. And now about Billy Graham. Well, all right. Uh, I'm going to begin in the middle of a sentence. Uh, we'll see where it goes, and we'll take it. We'll see how Billy sounds this morning. And uh, those of you who remember the great Billy Graham crusades, you'll remember this voice, won't you? The problems and the perplexities that we face as a nation seem to be almost overwhelming. Recently, one of our leaders speaking to a group of students at Johns Hopkins University said that we may well be living in the most confusing, bewildering, and perplexing hour of history. All of our leaders agree that the world seems to be plunging headlong toward disaster. However, today we're here in Albuquerque, in this church founded so many years ago. I believe that in this day of intellectual, moral, and spiritual confusion, that this church can have an impact upon the entire world. Now in a moment, I'm going to ask you to come, hundreds of you. You simply get up out of your seats, and I want you to come. And for those of you who have joined us tonight by television, we'd like to send you some literature. We'd like to send you a book that has been a blessing to tens of thousands of people around the world, <laughs> written by Pastor Skip. Just write to me, Billy Graham, Minneapolis, Minnesota. That's all the address you need, just Billy Graham, Minneapolis, Minnesota. And now until this same time next week, goodbye, and may the Lord bless you real good. I just want to say, Skip, that you have a very responsive uh, congregation, very friendly. Too bad that we can't stay longer, but we're going to have to leave right after this to fly back to the big bad city, well, a good city of Chicago. My wife and I uh, used to live close to O'Hare Field. Great big huge jets used to come over our house. In fact, one day I remember I was just walking from the dining room to the bedroom and a flight attendant told me to sit down. <laughs> So as you think about us in Chicago, pray for us. 
God bless you. What a marvelous ministry God has given to you. Well, today I'm speaking on the very sobering topic of the judgment seat of Jesus Christ. You know, the Bible says that there are going to be tears in heaven. Now, God will wipe them away, but what are tears doing in heaven anyway? Two possibilities. One is that there will be tears because there will be people in heaven who will look and find that their son or daughter is missing. And the very thought that their son and daughter are lost eternally, well might parents weep, or a wife weeping because of her husband. We understand that. But you know, there may be another reason why there are going to be tears in heaven. It's the reason that I suspect is perhaps the correct one, and that is tears of regret when we think of how we lived in light of all the opportunities God gave us. I believe that there are going to be tears at the judgment seat of Jesus Christ. Now, I have to clarify that when I speak about the judgment seat of Christ, I'm talking about you believers and me as a believer, we are going to stand there. If you're here today and you've never savingly believed on Jesus, you've never trusted him as your savior, you will not appear at this judgment. You'll appear at another judgment described in the book of Revelation, a judgment that is horrific and terrifying. But today I'm speaking to Christians. And uh, the Bible says we shall all appear. And there's some people who say, well, you know, it's no big deal because doesn't Calvary cover it all? And the answer is, yes, of course, Calvary covers it all legally. When you receive Christ as Savior, you're forgiven past, present, and future. You become a son or daughter of God. I get that. But that doesn't mean that God does not judge justified sinners. For example, today if you sin, God judges you, God disciplines you, even though Calvary covers it all. When Ananias and Sapphira died and they arrived in heaven after lying, you know the story in the book of Acts, I can imagine they said to one another, well, what is this? Why did we get judged that way? Doesn't Calvary cover it all? Legally, yes. But still, we're going to be judged on the basis of what we did with what God gave us. And then you have those super spiritual people who say, well, you know, uh, you know, these rewards are just crowns and aren't we just going to cast our crowns before Jesus anyway? Implying it doesn't really matter how I live. Well, I don't believe that the rewards mentioned in the Bible are medallions. If we do cast our crowns before Christ, we're going to have to pick them up again because the Bible talks about those who are going to rule with him forever and ever. I believe that rewards have to do with degrees of responsibility in the kingdom and where God is going to slot you in responsibility. One day I had a man who said, you know, I'm a Christian, but I'm backslidden. And that may apply to many of you right now. You say, well, yeah, I'm a Christian, but I, my life is all cluttered with the world and all. And he said, you know, I hope I can just get to heaven as long as I sit in the back seat. That'll be fine with me. And I said, you know, what if, to use your terminology, God wanted you in the front seat where these folks are, but you're in the back seat because uh, you've been unfaithful to Christ, to use your analogy, and because you haven't pleased Jesus. Don't you think that would be very serious? Well, yeah, it would be. And by the way, I've got my eye on those of you in the back row over there. <laughs> and for you who are in the front, I often say this, front seat on earth is front seat in heaven. You're going to do okay, especially if you take notes, too. <laughs> and visiting Moody Church would help, by the way. <laughs> I always say it's not necessary to visit Moody Church to go to heaven. But why take a chance? <laughs> you can correct my theology a little bit there, skip later. No, we're talking about something very serious. It has to do with pleasing Jesus. That's why the great theologian Jonathan Edwards says that he's going to do whatever he possibly can to do well at the judgment seat. I hope you feel like he does or did, and I feel that way too. Well, you know, in 1 Corinthians 3, and you don't need to turn to this. I'm only going to remind you of this. In 1 Corinthians 3, the apostle Paul uses this illustration. 
He said, if we build upon the foundation of gold, silver, and precious stones, it'll survive the fire. If we build on the foundation of wood, hay, and stubble, it'll burn up. And he says, each man's work and each woman's work will be tried with fire. He says, those who have built upon the foundation of wood, hay, stubble, they themselves will be saved, but so is by fire. The imagery is that they are running out of a house and, the, and the, the house collapses behind them. The house represents their life and everything goes up in smoke because they only lived for themselves and they didn't live for the Jesus who redeemed them. What a tragedy. Now let's take our Bibles and turn to the text for today. The text is actually 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, you say, well, Pastor Lutzer, I don't have my Bible, but I have it on the cell phone. Well, then find it on the cell phone. I've gotten used to that at Moody Church, but every once in a while I do this. Now look at me for just a moment. I point out this actually is a Bible, but um, however you may have it, iPod, cell phone, whatever. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. For we must all, and Paul here is speaking about himself, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Takes your breath away. What I'm going to do is to give you three characteristics of the judgment seat of Christ and then three implications that I hope will change your life. Three characteristics. First of all, we're going to be judged fairly. We're going to be judged fairly. You say, well, where is that in the text? This is, after all, the judgment seat of Jesus Christ, the one who died to redeem us, the one who loves us, the one who became our brother. He's going to be doing the judging, and of course, he would like to have us do well. He is going to be eminently fair. And standing there in the presence of Jesus, we will all have to deal with reality, nothing but reality. No attorney to tweak it to make ourselves look better. No fact will be overlooked. If you were brought up in an abusive home, it affected the way in which you lived and so forth. All of those things are going to be taken into account. And when your judgment is over, nobody is going to dispute it because we'll know that the judgment was indeed fair and just. And you'll be judged on the basis of what you did since your second birth, not your first birth. Some of you perhaps were converted later in life and you have a very sordid story. Well, after we get saved, we are saved unto good works, and those are the works that we are going to be judged for, and in a few moments I'll help you understand what that means. So number one, we're going to be judged fairly. Secondly, we're going to be judged individually. Your Bibles are open. We're going to be judged individually. Notice what it says. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Each one. You know, I attended a small Bible college in Canada, and the only requirement to be in the choir is that you make it into the Bible college. So we had about 65 students. All students were in the choir, and I'm not a bad singer. But, you know, sometimes we had to learn new music, and uh, so what I would do kind of is mouth the words, and the choir, of course, would... Uh, would mask that and, and take over, and nobody would know the difference. My dear friend, when you stand before Jesus, it's not going to be with a choir. It's going to be you one-on-one. -on -one. It is an individual audition, just you and Jesus. You say, well, I certainly hope that it's going to be private. Well, uh, perhaps and perhaps not. You know, Jesus told some parables which would indicate that it would be public. But I thought about this, and I really do believe that when we are standing there in the presence of Jesus, we will not care if our friends are watching, if heaven and hell is watching. The only thing that will matter is the look on the face of Jesus. We'll be judged individually. Wow. Third, we'll be judged thoroughly. We'll be judged thoroughly. Now your Bibles are still open. You'll notice how the verse ends. Each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. 
When the Bible says that we shall all appear before the judgment, the Greek word is phanerao, we could interpret it, for we shall all be made manifest before the judgment seat of Christ. We shall be revealed. That's a good way to interpret it. One commentator said it's like when we were as children, we would take out uh, our pockets and turn them inside out and reveal every last little bit of lint. That's how thorough the judgment is going to be. You say, well, will we see our sins? I'll answer that in just a moment, except to say that this is where the final adjudication takes place. Here's a man who leaves his wife and children, runs off, marries somebody else. Let's suppose he's a Christian. He's not acting like a Christian, but let's suppose he is. And his kids grow up, his wife has to do all kinds of work to raise them and all the implications for the children and all. And now are you telling me that both of them die, the wife and the husband, both are Christians. Jesus is going to say, well, you know, let bygones be bygones. Hold hands and walk into eternity. Are you kidding me? That's why the Bible says, dearly beloved, writing to Christians, do not avenge yourselves. Why? God says, I am the avenger. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, he says, judge nothing before the time because the Lord is going to come and the Lord is going to judge. And by the way, he's going to disclose the motives of men's hearts. Can you get any more thorough than that? Wow, this is serious business. You say, uh, and by the way, the better you clean up your relationships before this time, the better, I think, less things to take care of at the judgment seat of Christ. Will we see our sins? Well, one theologian put it this way, if we do see them, they will be represented to us as forgiven, because remember, this is not a whipping situation where Jesus gets even with us. It is an evaluation, so it's not as if our sins are going to be heaped upon us, but um, I believe that at that moment, Skip, I believe that at the judgment seat of Christ, we are going to understand grace as we have never understood grace before. Because we'll see how bad our sin was, we'll see the perfection of Jesus Christ's work on the cross, and no wonder we will say, oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily, forever, a debtor to God's grace. Now, I've thought about this, what if God were to do this, and I'm not saying it's the way he will, but what if he were to take everything that you and I do and turn it either into gold, silver, or precious stones, or wood, hay, and stubble? So here you would see your whole life in this great big heap before you. In fact, there's a man who had a dream like that. He saw his life with all of this material, and then it was torched. And in the dream, he saw himself when all the ashes had settled down, going through the ashes, finding little bits of gold, silver, and precious stones that he put into his tin cup. I don't know if it's going to be that way. But one way or another, the judgment will be thorough. You say, well, is Jesus going to be angry with us? I don't think he's going to be angry. But my dear brother and sister today, I believe in many instances he's going to be disappointed, considering all that he gave to us, all the opportunities, and our selfish life squandered. You say, well, Pastor Lutzer, what is he going to be looking for? I mean, aren't you interested in that? What is it that Jesus is going to be looking for? What will survive the fire? Where's the gold? Well, let me give you an impartial list, but some ideas. Number one, the joyful acceptance of injustice. How are you handling injustice as a Christian? If you lash out, if you become angry, if you don't see God in the midst of your injustice, um, you know, you're doing badly here. Jesus said this, in fact. He says, blessed are you when men revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for so persecuted they the prophets before you. And your reward will be great. Wow. I, uh, Skip and I have been talking and I uh, pointed out that given today's culture, Christians are going to have to make decisions. You and I are going to have to get used to being ridiculed, being told that we are haters, that we are uh, bigoted, just because of our convictions. And the question is, how will we endure it? Jesus says, rejoice when that happens, because your reward will be great. Wow. Let me give you a second one. Financial generosity. You know the story about how 
you know, you give money to the Lord's work and it's in heaven where moth and rust doesn't corrupt, correct, uh, corrupt and the Dow Jones Industrial Average cannot touch it. Wow. Hospitality, Luke 14. I'm paraphrasing. When you call a party, don't, don't just call all your friends whose jokes you already know. You can finish the end of their stories and all that stuff. Go out to the street, Jesus said. Find the poor, find the blind, find the lame. Bring them in and have a feast. And then you know what Jesus says? You talk about motivating people by rewards. He did it through his whole ministry. He said, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. Amazing how God uses rewards all throughout the New Testament as motivation. And then uh, things like your vocation, you know, uh, you don't like uh, uh, your boss. Don't, don't work for your boss tomorrow because your boss is probably unfair. He doesn't pay you enough. Other people in the office are uh, chiseling things. They are manipulating behind your back. Listen, if you're going to work for him, you're going to be miserable. So here's what you do. You switch your owner. You work for Jesus. Say, Jesus, I'm coming to work today for you. I'm going to serve today as if I'm serving you, as if I'm going to get my paycheck from you. That's what it says in the book of Colossians. It even says to the slaves of that day, don't work with eye service as a man pleaser, but serve the Lord from the heart, and you'll receive the reward of the inheritance. Well, we could go on, but I have to give you one more, and that is learning to love the unlovable. Anybody here, God brought somebody unlovable into your life? <laughs> you say, yeah, I married the guy. <laughs> and you know, this isn't Target. You don't have a return policy. You're stuck with this guy. You learn to love him. Why did Jesus bring him into your life? You've often wondered that. Well, one of the reasons may be so that you could get a reward. God says in Luke chapter 6, he says, if you love enemies, and I hope he's not your enemy, but if you learn to love those and expect nothing in return, you're going to be like your heavenly father, and your reward will be great. God has given us all kinds of opportunities to get rewards. You say, well... Maybe a few too many, as far as we're concerned, but the simple fact is the way we live now has huge implications for the judgment seat and for eternity. Well, those are just some things Jesus is looking for. Now what I'd like to do is to give you three concluding implications. First of all, we learn that the judgment is going to be fair, it's going to be individual, it's going to be thorough. And now the life-changing implications. Number one, every day is either a plus or a minus. It's either gold, silver, precious stones, or wood, hay, stubble, or a mixture of the two. But every day, including today, you'll be making an investment that will show up in eternity. Billy Graham, who played such an inspiring role in my life and also your pastor's life, was in interviewed by Diane Sawyer, and she said, how would you like to be remembered? As I remember the interview, Billy didn't really answer her question. He said something else. He said, I'd like to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant, but I don't think he will, I will. And he turned away in sadness. Well, I thought the very same thing you think. First of all, humility, Billy, is good, but you're overdoing it a little bit. That's what I thought. <laughs> I jokingly say that your pastor has a sermon on humility. The problem is he hasn't found a crowd big enough to preach it to. <laughs> humility. But the second thought that came to my mind is this. Billy, if you're not sure you're going to do well, then what about me? And what about you? But in this regard, Billy was right. He's not going to be rewarded greatly because he preached to large crowds. That was his calling. That was his gifting. It is God who made him famous. He's going to be rewarded on the basis of the faithfulness with which he lived out his calling, what he did with what God gave him. And that's why we can say with absolute confidence that some of the people who will be rewarded the most are people whose names we have never heard. 
You know, there's a woman by the name of Sophie Mueller that I've been told about who, who invested her life in, I think it was South America, working there with primitive people. She wouldn't come back to America. When she ran out of money, she stayed there and worked, labored and gave people the gospel and gave her life for those people. When she returned to the United States and died, I think there were six people at her funeral. She'll be greatly rewarded at the resurrection of the just, I can assure you. I can assure you. And she'll be ahead of all the rest of us. You know, those of us in public ministry, we oftentimes get our rewards here. Jesus warned about that. Do you know what really attracts the attention of God is faithfulness in obscurity. You say, well, nobody's appreciating what I'm doing. I'm serving the Lord in obscurity. Well, if you're serving the Lord in obscurity, God says, I like that. Because you're not getting any thanks or any kudos, any encouragement now. You're doing that for me. So every day is either a plus or a minus. George Whitfield, great American evangelist, wanted to be, uh, he wanted this on his tombstone. He didn't quite get it, but it's next to his tombstone. The manner of man George Whitfield was that day shall declare. I mean, it takes your breath away. Doesn't matter what the press said, doesn't matter what other people said, doesn't matter all the criticism that he received. The manner of man he was that day shall declare. The manner of man your pastor Skip is, the manner of man I am that day shall declare because who you are in the presence of God is who you are and nothing more and nothing less you have in the presence of God nothing to hide, nothing to lie about, nothing but reality, who you are in the presence of God. Wow. Every day you either are building on one foundation or another or a mixture. Second, I'm going to ask the question, what can we gain? Well, I think we can gain ruling with Christ. You know, the Bible doesn't necessarily say that every Christian gets to rule with Christ. Perhaps they do. There's a difference of opinion. But I find it interesting that ruling with Christ in the Bible is often associated with suffering. For example, Paul says, if we suffer with him, we shall reign with him. It's faithfulness that grants you that. Listen to the words of Jesus. He who overcomes, to him I shall grant to sit with me on my throne, even as I overcame and sat with my father on his throne. Did you get that? Jesus said, if you're an overcomer, you can sit on my throne. I happen to believe that not all Christians are overcomers. What a reward for faithfulness. So we can gain ruling with Christ. What can we lose? Well, you know, I take the point of view that not all Christians will hear, well done. I don't think I can think right now of anything sadder than to be in the presence of Jesus welcomed by him into heaven, but not hearing him say, well done, good and faithful servant. Not all Christians will hear that. Well, might there be tears in heaven. You know, in India, there's a story, a legend that they like to tell about a man who is riding along in his beautiful chariot, a wealthy Raja. And um, along the way, there was a beggar, and the beggar saw the chariot coming, and so he went and stood along the side of the road with his uh, beggar's uh, bowl and uh, wondered whether or not the Raja would give him anything. To his shock and delight, the Raja got off. His chariot went and said to the beggar, Beggar, give me some of your rice. Oh, yeah, the beggar was very angry. You're the wealthy man and you want me to give you some of my rice. But he did, in his anger, he gave the wealthy Raja a grain of rice. The Raja said, beggar, give me more of your rice. By now, the beggar was absolutely furious, but he did give him a second grain of rice. And the Raja said, beggar, give me more of your rice. By now, the beggar was absolutely furious. He took one more grain of rice, gave it to the wealthy Raja, and then walked off in a huff. The Raja got on his chariot and left. In his anger and fury, the beggar looked into his bowl and he saw something glitter. He looked at it carefully. It was a grain of gold the size of a grain of rice. 
He looked more carefully and found just two more. And he began to weep and said, if I only I had known, I'd have given him all of my rice. My friend today, Jesus is generous. Did you know that? What rice are you and I withholding from him? Is it our pet sin? Is it a relationship that where we refuse to forgive? Is it our own selfish, narcissistic way of life where everything revolves around us and we don't sacrifice for God and for others? What is it that we withhold when Jesus said, give me your rice and I'll give you gold that will survive the fire. The gold, the silver, the precious stones. There are some of you here who've never received Christ as Savior. What I need to remind you of that when you believe on Jesus, when you trust him and his finished work, you become a son or daughter of God. And as a result of that, you can begin the process now of serving him. Good works don't contribute at all to your salvation. It has to be all of grace, all of Jesus. But when you belong to him, he gives you the opportunity of you giving him your rice in turn for his gold. What a deal. In a moment, we're going to pray. If God has talked to you, what do you need to say to God? Now, we're only going to be praying for a moment, but... You can't deal with this in just a moment. Some of you ought to go home. You ought to lock the door, get on your knees, and say, God, I'm going to stay here as long as I need to take care of my need and the issues in my life that are displeasing to you. It is, after all, all about pleasing the Jesus who died for us. Let's bow together in prayer. And if God has talked to you, would you talk to God right now? And if you've never believed on Jesus as your Savior, you can trust him even where you are. You can say, thank you, Jesus, for dying for me. And I receive your work on the cross as my substitute. I turn from my sin to you. Believe on him and be saved. And if you are a believer, so... What rice are you withholding from Jesus? You talk to him right now. Father, thank you for these dear people. Thank you for their love for you. But oh, Father, I pray for myself as I pray for them. Help us, Lord, to be willing to give you all of the bowl of rice, to withhold nothing and invest the rest of our life serving you in obedience, in holiness, and joy. We long, Father, we, we're unworthy of it, but we long to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Bless the pastor. Thank you for his marvelous ministry here. And we shall give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. We hope you've enjoyed the special service from Calvary Albuquerque, featuring our special guest speaker, Dr. Erwin Lutzer. How will you put the truths you learned into action? Let us know. Email us at mystory@calvaryabq.org. And just a reminder, you can give financially to this work at calvaryabq.org. Thank you for listening to the special message from Calvary Albuquerque.